The maniac Albert Fish is considered one of America's earliest officially recognized maniacs. This old man abducted, raped, murdered, and ate children in the early 20th century. The exact number of his victims has not been established to this day. I have always wanted to hurt others and to make others hurt me. Albert Fish Hello, this is Defunct City. Subscribe to our channel and don't forget to click on the bell so you don't miss new episodes and stay informed. The future maniac and cannibal fish was born in Washington, D.C. in the year 1870. His father, Randall Fisher, a fertilizer dealer, was 75 that year. He was 43 years older than Albert's mother. The maniac had two brothers and a sister, but he was the youngest. Much later, psychiatrists and researchers would argue that all members of the Fish family suffered from various mental disorders. Most likely, by making absentee diagnoses, scientists were trying to find the most real, from their point of view, explanation of what turns an ordinary person into a bloody monster. In any case, reliable evidence of Fishy's mental abnormalities has never been presented. At birth, the future maniac was named Hamilton. When he was five years old, his father Randall Fish died right on the street of a heart attack. Fitch had no special savings, and Hamilton's mother was forced to give him to an orphanage. There he got a nickname consonant with his name. He could not get rid of it for a very long time, so he disliked the name given to him at birth. Also, while at the orphanage, Fitch realized that he took pleasure in pain. In those days, many orphanages in America practiced physical punishment in the form of flogging. During the punishments, and then the abuse, Little Fish got an erection. This was unusual for an eight-year-old boy and served as an additional incentive to bully Fish. Four years later, in the year 1879, Albert's mother was able to get a government job and take her son. But the orphanage experience changed the future monster forever. He was only 12 when he entered into a same-sex relationship with a boy letter carrier who delivered telegrams. Around the same time, Fish began to visit public baths where he could freely consider men without clothes. He was particularly attracted to boys between the ages of 7 and 12. In the year 1890, Fish moved to New York City. Immediately after the move, he changed his hated name Hamilton to Albert. He later said that he moved to become a prostitute. Did he make good on his plans? It is not known. But the fact that after he moved, he began regularly forcing young boys into the act was established. The maniac chose his victims among street children, of whom there were many in the streets of New York at that time. They were reluctant to report to the police, so the police were unaware of Fish's antics. However, Albert's mother suspected something and decided to marry her son immediately. In 1898th year, Albert married a 19-year-old girl who picked him up his mother. From this marriage, Fish had six children, four sons, and two daughters. But he continued to hunt for children. In the year 1903, the maniac was caught stealing from a warehouse where he worked part-time as either a loader or storekeeper. He was sentenced to two years in prison and sent to the famous Sing Sing prison. In prison, Albert was quite popular. In those days, men with unconventional views still tried not to flaunt their predilections, so the hardened prisoners, who had not seen a woman in decades, had to use weaker cellmates. You don't have to force it. Albert was always for it. When he got out of prison in 1955, Fish went quiet for a while, or maybe not. There was no global informatization in those days, so some crimes never came to light. The first deprivation of life that Fish was charged with was in the year 1910. The victim was Thomas Biden of Delaware, who was 10 years old. The next massacre took place nine years later. Fish, according to the police, took the life of a mentally retarded boy in Virginia with a knife. The monster committed a new crime five years later. On July 14, 1924, eight-year-old Francis McDonald disappeared. 
Friends of the boy said that he left with an older thin man with a gray mustache. Police began a search for the gray man. One of Fish's nicknames given to him by the police for the color of his cape. But in those days, the police had no experience in investigating similar and motivated crimes, and the investigation went nowhere. On February 11, 1927, four-year-old Billy Gaffney went missing. Gaffney's three-year-old friend, also Billy, witnessed the kidnapping. He said that a strange man approached them while they were playing near the house. Why strange? He was so fabulous and not scary at all, the boy said and the witness also described the perpetrator's gray mustache, which he even allowed them to touch. No doubt today's cops would have picked up on the gray mustache and been able to relate these details. But it was the experience of the police of those days. The most famous kidnapping and taking of a life was committed by a maniac in June of the year 1928. Eighteen-year-old Edward Budd placed an ad in a newspaper looking for work in the countryside and gave his address. That's where 58-year-old Fish came in. He may well have wanted to kidnap the young man. When he arrived, however, he saw Edward's ten-year-old sister Grace and his plans changed. He spent a few hours at the Bad's house, promised to hire Edward, and left. Came back as promised a couple of days later. He told Edward to pack his things, and he'd pick him up later. And while Edward was packing up fish, he introduced himself as Farmer Frank Howard, and convinced Grace's parents to let her go with him to the party. They said their niece, who didn't live very far away, was having a birthday party. The gullible bullets let the girl go and never saw her again. Incidentally, two years after Grace's disappearance, the police arrested one Charles Edward Pope. It was his wife who informed the police that he had kidnapped the girl. Pope was put behind bars for four months. But at the trial his guilt could not be proven. When it turned out that Pope was going to divorce his wife and even moved out of the common apartment. Women's Revenge And six and a half years after the disappearance of Grace in November 1934, her mother Delia received an anonymous letter. This letter, sent by a maniac, became the most famous of all the criminal's messages. The details of the executioner's message were too shocking. Here is what was written in the letter. My dear Mrs. Budd, In the year 1894 my friend sailed as a sailor on a steamer under the command of Captain John Davis from San Francisco, instead of arriving in Hong Kong, China. Upon arrival, my friend and two other sailors went ashore and got drunk. When they returned, the ship had already left. There was a famine in China at the time. Meat of every kind cost one to three dollars a pound. Since it was the poor who suffered most, all the children under twelve were sold for food to save the older ones from starvation. A boy or girl under fourteen was not safe on the street. You could walk into any store and ask for a steak, and they would have cooked the meat for you. You would have been provided with pieces of the boy's or girl's body if you had only desired a tenderloin of such meat. The butt of a boy or girl is the most delicious part of the body. It's sold for the highest price. A friend who stayed there acquired a taste for human flesh. When he returned to New York, he captured boys 7 and 11 years old there. Hiding them in his remote home, he kept them tied up in the bathroom. Several times a day, he spanked them to make the meat taste better. The first one he took the life of was an 11-year-old boy because he was fatter and had more meat. The smaller boy repeated this path. At the time, I was living at 409 East Street. A friend had told me so often of the taste of human flesh that I decided to try it in order to form my own opinion. On Sunday, the 3rd of June, 1928, I'd addressed you at 406 West Street. I'd brought you a basket of strawberries. We had breakfast. Grace sat on my lap and kissed me. I decided to eat her. I offered to take her to the feast. You said yes, she could go. I led her to an empty house in Westchester that I'd had chosen beforehand. When we got there, I told her to stay outside. She was picking wild flowers. I went upstairs and took off all my clothes. 
I knew that if I started to do what I set out to do, I would get her blood dirty. When everything was ready, I went to the window and called out to her. Then I hid in the bathroom until she came into the room. When she saw me without my clothes on, she screamed and tried to run up the stairs. I grabbed her and she told me that she was going to tell my mother everything. First I took off all of her clothes. How she was kicking her legs and tearing. I strangled her. It took me nine days to completely eat her meat. I did not use her for sexual purposes, although I could have if I wanted to. Fish wrote in his letter. The maniac later told his lawyer that he had used Grace after all. But the police would not confirm this claim. In general, as psychiatrists noted, Fish was a pathological liar. Grace's parents did not believe in the reality of what the maniac had described. They thought they were being played a silly, horrible joke. But the letter was nevertheless delivered to the police and made its way into the hands of the chief investigator, William King. And the policeman did not think it was a joke. And he also immediately noticed that the letter was printed in a branded envelope. The hexagonal emblem of the New York Private Drivers Charity Association was clearly recognizable on the envelope. These envelopes were not produced in millions, but in small batches. King ordered thorough questioning of all employees of the organization as to the misuse of the envelopes. The doorman confessed that he had taken several envelopes for his own use, but that he had not had time to use them all. He left some of them in the room he had recently moved out of. The owner of the room said that after this doorman, the room was rented by an elderly thin man with a gray mustache. She also reported that the tenant received money from her son. Having moved out a few days ago, he had not received the last transfer and was due to come back for it. King decided to meet the suspicious grandfather himself. There were no SWAT teams in those days, and police officers sometimes went alone to arrest criminals. So King did. Albert Fish, as soon as the investigator introduced himself and offered to walk with him, pounced on King with two dangerous beats in his hands. The policeman twisted the maniac and took him to the headquarters apartment. There the monster immediately confessed to taking Grace's life, and the girl's mother and brother identified him. But the police decided to check Fish for other disappearances. His picture was published in the newspaper, and soon the police were approached by a trolleybus controller, who identified Fish as the man who on February 11th, 1,927, was riding in the transport with the little boy. The witness stated that he remembered the strange couple because the boy was without a jacket. He was crying and kept calling for his mother. It was the day Bill Gaffney disappeared, whose body was never found. The boy's mother went directly to the maniac and asked him to tell her about her son. And Fish told it like it was. He told me how he mocked him and how he ate him for four days. Already after Grace's mother's letter, most psychiatrists began to state that Albert Fish was insane and could not be tried. Apparently, this was the verdict the maniac was seeking as he recounted his exploits. The criminal also claimed to be a strong believer in God. And even when he ate his victims and drank their blood, he was simply performing a ritual. But even though psychiatrists were inclined to believe that he was insane, Fish was still brought before a jury. It may well have been a political decision. One way or another, on March 11, 1935, the trial began, which found Fish involved in three deaths. The police accused him of 15. The criminal himself confessed to 498. The trial ended 10 days later with the death sentence. After hearing it, the maniac exclaimed what a thrill to die in the electric chair. It would be the supreme pleasure, the only one I had not yet experienced. He really was a masochist and did not exaggerate in the slightest the pleasure he derived from pain. When Albert Fish was chained to the electric chair in Sing Sing Prison, which he already knew, on January 16, 1936, they could not pass the current through his body at once. The switch had to be turned on twice before the doctor pronounced death. The cause was discovered at the autopsy. 
It turned out that Fish had stuck dozens of needles in his body himself. Twenty-seven of them were found in the groan alone. This metal interfered with the normal flow of the electric current. But this same metal also caused unbearable suffering for Fish. It seems that the maniac had the full pleasure of a double execution.